Good afternoon. We will be going ahead and starting. And uh, today is going to be our last uh, recorded lecture of the series. So uh, hopefully uh, you'd be able to look back at the uh, semester uh, for summer 2021 and be able to say confidently that you did take uh, some useful information out of it and that uh, you got some uh, clinical uh, knowledge that you would be able to apply in your future careers, your present careers, even in your day-to-day -day life. And uh, with those hopes and uh, warm feelings of uh, sharing this wonderful opportunity to uh, basically be able to conduct this class with you all, I will go ahead and start uh, today's uh, chapter 16. Just a few quick reminders again. So as of now, we're pretty much done with everything. Uh, the only final few grades are your uh, lab quizzes. So that has to do with the lab work that I sent out earlier. Some of you already sent those in to me. Uh, I'm still waiting for the final few students to turn in their lab work. That has to do with uh, unit 14 and 15. And I believe it was 12, 13, 14, and 15. Uh, everything having to do with the central nervous system and the special senses. Also your connect uh, lecture quizzes. Uh, those will be graded after we reach the deadline. So all seven of those quizzes, I have not put in any of the grades yet. I will be doing that um, again on Wednesday. Uh, so Wednesday also is when you have your lecture exam number four, lab practical number four, and then only your comprehensive exam remains on Thursday. And we are done with the uh, semester. Uh, so keep up the good work. Let me know if you have any questions, feedback. Uh, and with those reminders, I will go ahead and start. Uh, the chapter having to do with special senses. So you might wonder, well, what is so special about sense? What are senses anyway? Well, we all know the five senses, uh, vision, taste, sight, smell, touch, right? Um, and they're all interpreted in our cerebral cortex in the different lobes that we mentioned before. Uh, in addition to that, uh, what makes these senses special is uh, these senses are only picked up by specialized receptors. For example, your photoreceptors, photo means light, not picture, but light in Greek. Uh, photoreceptors are only found at the back of your eyeball uh, on a region called the retina and nowhere else, okay? So they're specialized uh, photoreceptors found only there. Uh, chemoreceptors, right? Um, or auditory ossicles, your uh, listening apparatus only found in the inner ear and nowhere else, okay? And uh, same with taste, those chemoreceptors are found on the taste buds exclusively. So that is what makes these senses special. These are specialized senses with specialized receptors, which are found nowhere else. So for example, uh, butterflies, they can taste with their feet. Okay, some of you might know that, uh, but not humans. Okay, we have specialized receptors can taste with their feet. Okay. Uh, so that's what this whole uh, special senses thing is about, okay? So sensory receptors in general uh, are transducers, as we see here. So what are transducers? Any device that can take uh, any kind of stimulus and convert it into an electrical impulse, all right? And so all of our special senses are transducers. For example, our eyes uh, convert light energy, the images that fall on the back of the eyeball on the retina, into electrical impulses and they shoot those impulses uh, by means of the optic nerve back to your occipital lobe, lobe for further processing. Your olfactory receptors in your nose convert the chemical odor signals into electrical signals and send them to the brain, to the uh, area of your temporal lobe for further interpretation. Transduction, that's what it is. So uh, that's what the word is about. Transducers is what all of our special senses are. Receptive field, you're looking at that here in this picture, it simply tells you how sensitive uh, a given area is. For example, if you're looking at a very narrow, small receptive area, it's quite sensitive, all right, because it's very, very localized. But if you're looking at a larger receptive area, such as this here, then it's not going to be as sensitive as the one supplied, the little area which is supplied with a whole lot of nerves, all right? So then uh, sensations are uh, any stimulus that we can consciously perceive, right? that we are consciously aware of, uh, whether it's touch, pain, pressure, temperature change, itch, whatever it is, it's basically uh, 
what a sensation is. And a lot of information is going to our brain as we see here. Our brain takes up no less than 20% of the oxygen, total oxygen in our body, it goes to the brain. And for, a, for an organ that size, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a lot. And that tells you that the brain is one of the most metabolically active, if not the most metabolically active area in the human organism. And that's why we are called homo sapiens, uh, the thinking being, right? Thinking man, that's what homo sapiens actually uh, stands for and for good reason. All right, so, so modality has to do with what type of a stimulus are you getting, okay? So for example, the uh, nerve signals coming from through your optic nerve, your brain automatically interprets that as visual information. Those coming in through the cochlear nerve are, are interpreted as auditory. Uh, sensations, all right? In some people, uh, either the brain is differently arranged or because of a stroke or some brain injury or a brain tumor or something, they might start uh, intermixing their senses. For example, there are people who uh, listen music in colors or when they look at different colors, they hear different notes of music, right? So obviously the different modalities are kind of overlapping. So very in interesting uh, phenomenon that has been observed in people, right? So let's say seeing seeing music in colors and vice versa, right? So that tells you that the brain, uh, as amazing and fascinating and intriguing as it is, uh, it pulls all kinds of tricks on us, right? So, uh, so but modality, basically, that, that, that's what it is. It's, it's how you interpret a sing, certain information, uh, informational signal coming in. That's what we're looking at here. All right, so uh, let's start with general senses, okay? General senses like touch nothing too specialized about this. There's like light touch, hard touch, coarse touch, uh, all, all kinds of uh, different ones. Uh, but these are general senses, okay? So uh, you have the somatic sensory and then the visceral sensory receptors. The somatic sensory receptors uh, are found like in your skin, mucous membranes of the eyes, nose, mouth, right? Uh, GI tract, those areas. Also, uh, the position of your joints and muscles and tendons, those are picked up by your somatic sensory receptors. The visceral sensory receptors pick up this information from your viscera or in internal organs. Like if you have uh, the pain of heart attack or appendicitis or something, that's visceral sensory receptors picking up that information, okay? So here we are categorizing different types of uh, sensory receptors by means of their uh, mode of action. So exteroceptors are located on an outside surface, like on your skin and mucous membranes, like for touch or temperature or something. Uh, interoceptors are found within the body, right? For example, uh, the chemoreceptors on your carotid artery, which are sensing for the amount of oxygen or carbon dioxide in your blood. Interoceptors would be the term for them. Proprioceptors are those receptors that uh, detect the position of your joints, such as if you're sitting on a like a roller coaster, flying in a jet plane or something, the proprioceptors will be firing over time because your body positions are changing. Chemoreceptors. So now we are categorizing them not by means of uh, the origin of the stimulus, but by the modality. So chemoreceptors they pick up chemical signals uh, found in your nose and your mouth for taste and smell, of course. Thermoreceptors, therm for temperature, they pick up temperature found all over the body, photoreceptors only found in the back of the eyeball, in the retina. Mechanoreceptors uh, detect motion or movement or vibration, okay, as we can see here. Uh, nociceptors from the word noxious, pain receptors, and they're also found throughout your body, they pick up pain signals, okay. For example, if you like chili, uh, chili peppers, uh, you are actually uh, fond of stimulating your nociceptors of the mouth. That's what capsicum does, right? Capsicum is like chili, um, the chemical compound that gives chili peppers their characteristic taste, right? Uh, capsaicin, okay? That's what it's called. And uh, capsaicin is good for your health in moderate amounts, actually. It promotes blood flow, all right? So capsaicin promotes blood flow uh, to, to the mouth and the face area. And uh, so it helps with flushing out the toxins, if you will, from the area. Uh, so how does a sensory receptor function as a transducer? Because it changes different types of stim stimuli or input into uh, electrical signals, right? Okay, general range and structural what? Uh, structural, let me take a look here. Complexity of sensory receptors, what is associated with all sensory receptors? They send in sensations by transduction. 
sight, sound, smell, taste, all of them. Um, how do they provide input regarding the modality? So it could be like thermoceptors for heat, mechanoreceptors for touch, right? Nociceptors for pain location, whether they are exter external or internal, exteroceptors or interoceptors, intensity and duration of a stimulus as well. Okay, so let's try to classify the following sensory receptors, um, the ear and the sense of hearing. So it's a exteroceptor, first of all. This is also a, uh, uh, an auditory receptor, right? Uh, for the tongue, it would be a chemoreceptor and an exteroceptor. Uh, and for stretch receptors, those are interoceptors inside the body because it's in the bladder. Uh, and they are also nociceptors. Uh, they detect pain when your urinary bladder fills up with blood. So let's take a look at the tactile receptors first. The word tactile means uh, touch, right? So these are your touch receptors and they can be either uh, capsulated or unencapsulated, right? Meaning they either have a capsule surrounding them at the top, like a, wearing a helmet or they don't. So these are the three examples of unencapsulated tactile receptors, tactile disc, uh, free nerve endings and the root hair plexus, as you can see. Then there are three examples of encapsulated te tactile receptors as well, tactile corpuscle and bulb, bulbous corpuscle and lamellated corpuscle. Let's take a look at each. So free nerve endings, they are exactly what the name suggests. They are free nerve endings found throughout your skin, mainly for pain and temperature on your skin, all right? A root hair plexus, again, as the name suggests, they are nerves, sensory nerves wrapped around your hair follicle. So if someone is caressing your arm hair or there's like a light breeze blowing, root hair plexus will pick up that information, okay? Tactile discs, also called uh, Merkel cells, they are uh, responsive to light touch in your skin, okay? Here in this picture, you can see the three uh, unencapsulated or naked receptors, if you will, uh, free nerve endings, root hair plexus, and then the tactile disc or Merkel cells. All right, let's move on to the uh, encapsulated ones, the ones with the capsule. The first one is called the Krauss bulb. Uh, it's found in the dermis and the mucous membranes uh, on the skin for pressure and low frequency vibration. The end cross bulbs are also called uh, genital corpuscles because they're also found in your genital region. So on your glands, penis uh, or clitoris uh, and also around the uh, nipples. All right. And they detect and respond to vibration in those areas. Uh, lamellated or uh, pachinian corpuscles, as we can see here, again, found in your skin, hypodermis, uh, they detect deep pressure and high frequency vibration, as you can see. Uh, bulbous corpuscles, also known as Ruffini corpuscles, okay, again found in the dermis of the skin for deep pressure and skin distortion, such as when someone pinches your skin, all right. Uh, tactile or Meissner corpuscles, as you see here, again found in the uh, dermis of the skin for light touch discrimination. It's quite sensitive. For example, if someone is touching you with two needles close together, uh, tactile corpuscles pick that signal up as two individual different picks. So here in this picture, you can see the uh, Krauss end bulbs, also called the genital corpuscles, lamellated corpuscle, bulbous corpuscle, and the tactile corpuscle. They all have a, uh, what, a, a capsule at the top. Referred pain, we talked about that before uh, at quite some length. Referred pain is when you feel uh, some type of a pain in your, uh, on the surface of your skin, which is emanating from a, an organ. For example, the pain of your appendix. If you, when, whenever you have appendicitis, you feel it actually around your umbilicus, which is quite some distance away. Uh, T10 is that dermatome area. So that's a referred pain. And so uh, same with heart attack, as you see here, myocardial infarction, even though the heart is located here in the left mediastinum, the pain radiates all the way to your left arm, left forearm, back of the uh, body, uh, to your left jaw, all those kinds of places. So here in this picture, you can see uh, which organs have nerves that also have skin or cutaneous branches uh, to the overlying skin. So heart covers this area, appendix around the umbilicus, uh, ureters felt here, liver and gallbladder, interestingly, your right uh, shoulder, right? Phantom pain. So this is, a, a, again, an intriguing phenomenon, which is found in uh, like people who have had their limbs amputated, like war veterans or people with diabetes. Uh, and so even though that limb, let's say someone's right leg has been amputated, but the person might wake up at night uh, itching to itch their leg, which is not even there, uh, but they have this terrible urge to itch or they feel this excruciating pain in their right leg only to realize that it doesn't even exist there. Uh, so it's a, like a touching, it's a sad uh, kind of phenomenon, but what 
that tells you is that, that the brain still carries the memory and the mapping of that body part uh, and spontaneously is like sending out these signals, uh, even though the, the, the original organ is not even there anymore, okay? So uh, our brains are very good at deceiving us, right? Uh, and the point is to keep us alive. That's what brains do. Uh, so a lot of people ask questions like, well, why do we dream? Do dreams mean anything? What are dreams? What are nightmares, right? Uh, what is the old hack syndrome or oh, this whole succubus myth if you're into that kind of stuff? Uh, so I have addressed those questions in my, uh, in my ebook on Amazon and some of you did uh, get a chance to read it. Uh, so hopefully that will make for some interesting reading there and feel free to let me know if you have any comments there. Uh, what are three types of unencapsulated tactile receptors, free nerve endings, uh, root hair plexus, and uh, Merkel cells. And where they're located, dermis and hypodermis. Clinical significance of uh, referred pain, it tells you which organ might be affected based on the pain that you're feeling on the surface of the skin, kind of like surface anatomy. All right, so here we are looking at the olfactory apparatus first, your breathing apparatus, all right, which is of course, here in the nose. So what type of receptors do you have in the nose? Chemoreceptors, first up. Also remember that your nose needs to be moist in order for you to pick up uh, smells, all right? A completely dry nose, such as when you have allergies or if you've taken um, uh, antihistamines like uh, Benadryl, right? And you have a dry nose, uh, that makes you like kind of nose blind. You don't smell anything. Or if your nose is clogged, uh, completely clogged, okay? So basically, uh, you need a thin layer of mucus secreted by the goblet cells in your nose uh, for these odorants, odors, which are chemical signals to attach to them and then be carried to your brain, all right? So how does this happen? Here are the odor molecules. They attach to these microscopic structures called the olfactory hairs. Uh, they trigger an action potential and yet the dendrite goes onto the cell body uh, then moves up. Here are supporting cells which keep these dendrites alive and the basal cells. Here is an olfactory gland, again, useful for picking up smells. And then this action potential uh, moves through the cribriform plate, which is a bony plate and porous with holes in it for the nerve fibers to pass through it. And finally, it makes its way up uh, to your, uh, an olfactory nerve is your cranial nerve number one, remember that, to your uh, temporal region, okay? And the interesting thing about the olfactory uh, nerve is, it is the only sense or the only nerve that doesn't go through the thalamus. Now remember, the thalamus for your brain's post office, remember? Uh, but the olfactory nerve basically bypasses, it takes a detour around the thalamus uh, and goes directly to the emotional part of your brain, the limbic system in the, in the uh, temporal region, right? Bypasses the thalamus. So what it tells us in a way is, possibly a very first, very primal, very primitive sense. Uh, one of the five senses was the sense of smell, olfaction, okay? Even now people can smell fear. Literally we had the, that ability to pick up like fear or nervousness or confidence, those kinds of things at a subconscious level, what they call human pheromones, even though nobody has ever uh, uh, con conclusively shown them or or, 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 or manufactured them in spite of so many claims, right? But we know, like, for example, women who are ovulating, they smell more attractive to men, uh, and they pick this up at a subconscious level. In a highly interesting study done by uh, Dr. Jeffrey Miller, who's a professor of evolutionary biology at the University of Arizona, or New Mexico, one of those states, I think it's New Mexico. Um, and so what he did was uh, something called the stripper study. So this guy actually went from strip club to strip club and uh, he was keeping track of, of how much tips these uh, female strip strippers were getting throughout the month, all right? So I don't know what possessed him or how he got that idea, but he actually conducted that study. And so interestingly, what he found was uh, that the strippers were getting twice or three times the, number, the amount of tips that they would usually get when they were ovulating. So obviously, and these men, they, nobody knew obviously where in their menstrual cycle they were at any given point, uh, but something was being picked up uh, by the sense of olfaction at a subconscious level uh, where these people knew uh, that these women, women were more fertile during those years. Interesting. There was another study having to do with uh, t-shirts, right, uh, at the University of Scotland, where uh, many uh, undergrad male and female students were recruited 
to basically sniff these male student shirts. Uh, and the female students were recruited to do that. Uh, they were all young in between 20 to 25 years of age. Uh, and so what they had to do was after sniffing those uh, male shirts, uh, the female students were supposed to rank them according to their pleasantness, like which ones smelled least repulsive and more attractive uh, along those lines. Uh, so they did that. And then all of this data was uh, tabulated. And then finally they found out that the more different the immune system of the male was from the female, the more attractive that person, that male smelled to her, all right? Uh, but not too different. You had to be in that sweet spot, not too similar and not too different. Uh, and so what the evolutionary biologists got out of the study was, well, uh, this is nature's way of trying to prevent incest taboo. Uh, we do not really find these smells of those closely related to a sexually exciting, all right? Uh, because nature wants us to outbreed rather than inbreed. So interesting study. All right, so next up, we are looking at your sense of uh, taste or uh, gustation, that's what it's called. So you can look at different types of taste buds, the filiform, the fungiform, they look like fungi, like mushrooms, that's why the name, and the foliate, like foliage, like leaves, papillae. So different types of taste buds uh, that you can see here. So uh, the foliate ones are found on the posterior, lateral tongue, the side, uh, the side of the tongue, right? Um, the filiform ones are found on the anterior two thirds, the fungiform ones are located on the tip of the tongue, okay? And so if you look at the structure of those taste buds, very similar to the olfactory cells, very similar. Here's the gustat gustatory cell itself. This is what it looks like. A microvillus, little finger-like structure and the taste pore. This is where they pick up these, uh, the flavor or the taste of the chemical which is in your mouth and convey it uh, back to your glossopharyngeal nerve or your facial nerve to be carried again to your temporal cortex for further interpretation, whether it's sweet or sour or bitter or whatever the case is, okay? Uh, and remember, you need to have a wet mouth with saliva in order to taste. If your mouth goes dry, such as when you have a runny nose, allergies, or you've taken um, antihistamine drugs, you don't taste anything, right? Uh, so something else to remember here, you need uh, a layer of mucus or saliva in order for that to happen. So in the from the anterior parts of your tongue, uh, the taste sensation is taken by your facial nerve, which is cranial nerve number seven, uh, from the posterior two thirds, it's actually your glossopharyngeal nerve or nerve number nine that carries the taste up to your gustatory cortex in the uh, in the in the temporal region. Okay, and uh, this one goes through the thalamus. It's not like the sense of smell that goes directly to the temporal region. So these are the five tastes uh, that we are capable of tasting: sweet, salt, sour, bitter, and umami, which is a new addition. Uh, sweet is produced by sugary stuff, okay? And we have a taste for that. So that's why we have to be really careful with how much processed refined sugar and sweet stuff we are eating uh, because diabetes is, is one of the modern uh, main cause of uh, both mortality and morbidity, all right? Salt uh, is for metallic things like minerals, sodium, potassium, et cetera. Uh, sour is, uh, again, uh, acids like vinegar like uh, citrus, uh, citrus fruits, uh, orange juice or lemonade and things like that, right? Bitter is produced by these substances called alkaloids, which are manufactured by plants like unsweetened chocolate. Uh, and slightly bitter taste, uh, tasting foods are actually healthy for you. Remember that, okay? Alkaloids, uh, these are substances that plants produce in order to ward off pests and make them um, resistant to, uh, unfavorable conditions, right? Uh, prevent like things like uh, cells from growing out of control, all those kinds of things. So when you consume those alkaloids like coffee, like chocolate, uh, berries from the plants, plant food, you also get that benefit. Uh, and studies after studies have shown that uh, alkaloids basically cut out uh, your, your risk of cancer, uh, inflammation, uh, infections, right? All kinds of benefits, but humans by nature are more attracted to sweet, which gives them diabetes and acts as a magnet for germs, for infections. Uh, people get bit by more mosquitoes. If you have more sugar, if you like sugary foods, so do mosquitoes, they like your blood, right? Uh, so mosquito bites and sugar. There you go. Uh, you get more infections too, because bacteria, viruses, all of them love sugar. 
So the more of that in your mouth, in your bloodstream, the more diseases you should be prepared to face, even fungi, fungal infections too, uh, like yeast infection of the uh, vag vagina or in the mouth, right? Alkaloids in uh, controlled quantities are actually healthy for you, like unsweetened chocolate, coffee, those things. Umemi is like the flavor of meat or mushrooms, okay? Uh, all right, so here is the gustatory pathway, okay? The taste from your mouth, taste buds pick it up. Uh, so facial nerve takes it from the, from the where? Uh, from the posterior tongue and then the gloss of, uh, from the anterior and the glossopharyngeal nerve from the posterior two thirds of the tongue, right? Uh, so these taste sensations go up to your brainstem, medulla oblongata, to the pons, uh, to, from the primary neuron to the secondary neuron, then to the thalamus. Here's your tertiary neuron in the thalamus and from the thalamus to your temporal cortex and the gustatory cortex, where you can make sense of what type of taste you're tasting. What is the role of mucus in detection of uh, smell and taste? Mucus makes your uh, receptors wet and you need uh, that wetness for the chemical odorants or tastings to be dissolved in so you can actually feel them. Uh, why do some smells stimulate an emotional reaction? Because smell goes directly to your limbic system, your emotional part of the brain without going to the thalamus, very primal uh, sense, right? You can smell fear, you can smell attraction, you can smell all kinds of things at a subconscious level. Uh, which papillae of the tongue have taste buds and what is the basic composition of a taste bud? We looked at the composition of taste bud and the types of taste buds as well. What are the five basic taste sensations? Sweet, sour, smell, uh, sweet, sour, bitter, and uh, umami and salty. What is the specific stimulus detected by each? We just mentioned it. All right, so here we're gonna start with our uh, next special sense, which is the sense of, of vision and the eye. So as we see here in the eye, um, of course you have the eyebrows at the very top, which are hair that grow in tufts and their job is to filter out any dust, debris, sweat uh, that might be trickling into your eye for protection. Same with your eyelashes, right? And then you have your eyelids, the superior and the inferior eyelids uh, that you can see here. This white area of the eye is called the sclera. It's a fibrous, tough fibrous uh, connective tissue that gives shape to your eye, makes it like rounded, all right? The colored part of the eye is called the iris. And this color is based on the amount of uh, the pigment melanin in your eye. So you don't have like a, a blue colored pigment for blue eyes or a green colored pigment for green eyes, no such thing. It's all melanin. Uh, so if you have a lot of dark brown eumelanin, you get dark brown eyes, right? Uh, if you have lesser amounts of melanin, they, tur they turn a light brown. If you have even lesser amounts, it turns like a hazel color. If you have lesser amounts, it turns blue. And if you have the least amount of melanin, uh, your eyes turn green, okay? Uh, and because that's how the uh, light reflects of, of, the, uh, of the melanin, right? Just like blue color is the most scattered color. So sky is technically not blue. It's just because uh, the, 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 the color blue is scattered the most. And so that's what makes the eyes blue too, right? Uh, in the middle, you have this uh, uh, dark circle called the pupil, and it controls the amount of eye uh, the, the, the amount of light entering your eye and falling onto the retina. So it contracts or constricts, cause something called meiosis when, the, when you're in bright light and it um, dilates, it gets bigger, uh, something called midriasis when you are in dark conditions or when you're excited or when you like what you're seeing, uh, your pupils dilate. You're seeing that, all of those here as well. Lateral palpebral uh, commissure, this angle of the uh, eye here, and this is your medial com uh, uh, commissure. So these are the two angles of the eyes, right? Uh, what else? A lacrimal caruncle. This is a little uh, kind of like a drain that takes your tears. Uh, lacrimal means tears. So the tears flow down the lacrimal caruncle here. Okay. So the same structures, you can see them uh, in a profile. That's your muscle called the levator palpebrae superioris muscle. But when you open your eyelids, this muscle, it elevates your upper eyelid, as we mentioned before. Here's the eyebrows. Then you have the orbicularis oculi muscle. Again, keeps your eyes open, uh, conjunctival fornix. Uh, then you have this transparent membrane called ocular conjunctiva, okay? The conjunctiva is this uh, transparent membrane that uh, protects your eye and nourishes it, uh, but it can also get inflamed and irritated, such as when you have a pink eye. A pink eye is a, a case of conjunctivitis or inflammation of the conjunctiva. 
this fibrous uh, transparent layer that protects your eye, all right? And it goes, it doubles up uh, on your eyelids too, on the insides of your eyelids, all the way to your front of your eyeball. Uh, this membrane covers all of that area, okay? All right, uh, palpebral fissure, that's the open area of the eye. Uh, tars tarsal glands, they secrete mucus, okay? Orbital fat uh, that cushions the eyeball inside of the orbit over here. So you see all of those structures in this picture as well. Uh, and then you have a transparent layer called the cornea in the front. Cornea, again, also protects the eye and uh, helps with focusing the light rays onto the back of the retina for the formation of a clear image. That's what cornea does. So lacrimal apparatus, this of course is uh, what produces tears like lacrimal glands, uh, which are located uh, on the lateral upper side of your eyeball. Right over here is where you have tear glands or lacrimal glands. Uh, tears have salt in them. They also have uh, bactericidal properties, things like lysozyme, which kill bacteria. So they are really there to cleanse and moisten your eye and, and to lub lubricate it as we see here, right? So very important. And uh, a lacrimal gland is what produces it, and then you, when you blink, that blinking action acts like uh, like uh, the, the the windshield wipers on your car. It, they they spread, uh, the blinking action spreads the tears all across the anterior side of your eye to 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 keep it clean, as we can see here. All right, so this is the whole uh, scheme of things as we see here. Here's the lacrimal gland; it secretes uh, tears uh, side of the eye when you blink. It spreads all around, uh, and then this uh, the tears collect here in the medial uh, lacrimal caruncle, and then they drain out through the lacrimal canaliculi into your what is called your lacrimal sac and down your nasolacrimal duct. So it leads from your eye down to your nose, and this explains why when you're crying bitterly too much, uh, your nose starts to run. That's actually your tears draining down the nasolacrimal duct and coming out. The uh, same reason why you feel when you put eye drops, you feel them in the back of your throat because they actually wash down the nasolacrimal duct and from the back of your nose to the back of the throat. Okay, you can see it now here. Okay, so uh, here are your two eyeballs in this picture, okay. Fovea centralis, that is a region on your retina, on the very back of the eyeball, where you have the best visual acuity. You see in best vision, clear vision right over here. Uh, Fovea centralis, which is just lateral to your blind spot, interestingly. This is your blind spot, okay, uh, where the optic nerve is uh, exiting the eyeball. Uh, you cannot, there's no vision here. So this is your blind spot, but right next to it, lateral to it is Fovea centralis, as you can see. All right, so here are the three tunics, so coverings of the eye, as you can see. One is fibrous in the front, vascular, which is like reddish in color. Vascular means bloody. And then retinol, which is your uh, visual layer all, in, all the way in the back. So what is the fibrous tunic made up of? Sclera, which is this the white of the eye, the white part, uh, which is this tough fibrous connective tissue that gives your eyeball its shape. And cornea is this transparent a membrane which is used for protecting the eye and also for converging or focusing the light rays on your retina, right? This is your best visual acuity. This is fovea centralis right here, right next to it up here. This is the blind spot where the optic nerve emerges. This is the blind spot. So no cones found in this area, no rods and cones. Rods and cones are your visual receptors. They help you see. Uh, uh, cones during bright light and for colors and rods and under the cover of darkness uh, for peripheral vision and those kinds of things, okay? Uh, then the vascular tunic is made up of the iris. Iris is the colored part of the eye. It's a muscle which controls the diameter of your pupil, how big or small your pupil is. The ciliary body over here, okay? And the ciliary body, again, is what the, uh, the suspensory ligaments of the lens are attached to. So the ciliary body controls the diameter of your lens, whether it's a rounded lens or whether it is an elongated lens for focusing the light. And then the choroid layer, it's a pigmented area here. Um, then the retina has two layers again, a pigmented layer and a neural layer. The neural layer carries your photoreceptors called rods and cones, which help you see. So here in this picture, you can see all of those things in the eyeball clearly, all right? So cornea, right here, or conjunctivitis as well, the uh, conjunctiva, not conjunctivitis. So that is your anterior eye, right? Uh, here's the pupil, the hole between your colored 
part of the eye called the iris. Those are the irises, right? Here's your lens, which is a clear transparent protein, the lens. The lens is attached by the suspensory ligaments that you see here to the ciliary body. The ciliary body controls uh, your lens. So for example, when you're looking for close vision, for near vision, something is very close to your eyeball, the uh, uh, ciliary muscles contract and make your lens more rounded like a basketball. So that helps with focusing the light on your fovea centralis for best vision. When you're looking at things far away for far vision, uh, the ciliary muscles in the ciliary body relax and the lens becomes more football shaped like it's right now. It looks like more like a football, right? Uh, and so that helps with focusing the light. So for close vision, it's uh, basketball shape, right? Near vision, let's say near vision equals uh, basketball lens, right? Basketball shaped lens. And far vision, uh, Far vision means, what is it? Uh, football, right? Football lens, yes. Football lens. Okay. And that explains why if you're looking at your device or reading a book or looking at anything up close for too long, you get a headache because your ciliary muscle is constantly contracted for long periods of time trying to make your lens all rounded and basketball-like. And any muscle, when you contract it too much, it starts to hurt. So these ciliary muscles, they cause headache when they're contracted. So the I ideal thing to do is uh, follow the 2020 rule. So whenever you're focusing on something, your cell phones or books or whatever, Kindle that you're reading up close, uh, every 20 seconds, look away and look at something which is at least 20 feet away and spend 20 seconds doing that and then get back to your activity and then take a break every 20 seconds like that, all right? Okay, so what else do we have here? So you see the suspensory ligaments, the ciliary muscles and the ciliary process uh, here, all right? Okay, so this is your anterior chamber of the eye, okay? Uh, before we get there, lens, iris, cornea, pupil, you see all of them. Uh, these are two muscles, sphincter pupillae muscle, which makes your pupil smaller when you are in bright light and the dilator pupillae muscle, which dilates your eyeball, your pupil when you are in darker conditions. This is your anterior chamber all the way from your cornea to the lens. This is called the anterior chamber, and it is filled up with a fluid called the aqueous humor, which is produced by the ciliary process, okay? Something to remember. Uh, aqueous humor can, is found within the anterior cavity or anterior chamber of the eye, which extends from all the way from the cornea back to the lens. Uh, and what the aqueous humor does it, it lubricates it, nourishes it, removes wastes and all those kinds of things. So from behind the lens, here's the lens, behind the lens all the way to the retina, this is your posterior chamber. And this is filled up with this jelly-like fluid called uh, the vitreous humor, which gives it shape, makes it rounded. Uh, so in high school, we did uh, cow eyeball dissections. We actually actually cut into cow, cow eyeballs, right? So cow eyeball dissection. And one of the things I had to warn my students, my high schoolers was to do not poke into the eyeball too vigorously in the posterior chamber or, 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 or in the anterior chamber because the aqueous humor is gonna just spurt, you know, uh, squirt out at you. Uh, and when you cut into the posterior cavity, this jelly-like stuff is gonna plop out uh, and they love to play with that. It's like a squishy, right? As gruesome as it sounds, uh, but that's the vitreous humor, all right? And it gives shape to the eyeball. Here's your optic disc with the optic nerve, op uh, the optic nerve uh, with the optic artery, central artery of the retina and the central vein. This is your blind spot, no vision forms here. Here is your fovea centralis that has the maximum number of cones in this area and the best visual acuity is found in this area too. You can see the choroid, which is this darkly pigmented area, right? And then the retina, which is where your photoreceptors are at. So you see all of those structures here sclera, cornea, choroid, ciliary body, take some time going over this information here. This is what happens when you're in bright light or when you do not like what you're seeing or hearing, your pupils constrict. Uh, and so this is caused by the sphincter pupillae muscle, which is under your parasympathetic control. Rest and digest causes pupillary constriction. Uh, on the other hand, in low light and dark conditions or when you're excited or aroused by what you're seeing or hearing, your pupils dilate by means of the contraction of the dilator pupillae muscle, which is innervated by your sympathetic fight or flight uh, nervous system. Remember drugs, opioids, uh, uh, depressants, CNS depressants will cause your uh, 
pupils to constrict. So if you're working in the ER, someone comes in into like a semi-comatose condition, there's a question of some drug overdose, you'll shine your pen light into the eyeballs and you see that the pupils are constricted, think opioids, right? Uh, depressants will cause meiosis. Meiosis means people with contractions like opioids, morphine, derivatives, right? Heroin, heroin, alcohol is a, alcohol itself is a depressant. It's a depressant, right? Um, there you go. Uh, on the other hand, when there is a question of an overdose with stimulants, right? You will see the exact opposite, midrasis. Midrasis is when your pupils are dilated like, uh, cocaine intoxication or uh, amphetamines, crystal meth, right? Amphetamines do ecstasy, which is a type of amphetamine. Uh, all of those stimulants will uh, basically cause your pupils to dilate. Uh, so for depressants, also tranquilizers, right? Like sleeping pills, tranquilizers, hypnotics, hypnotics, uh, barbiturates, again, sleeping pills, right? Okay, uh, so here is your vision and how it is basically conducted up to your brain from here, okay? So what do we have? We have the, uh, the uh, posterior cavity, here's the retina, right? Here you have the axons of the ganglion cells which convert light images, light rays into electrical impulses the ganglion cells that take this message up to the bipolar cells here. You see the bipolar cells, right? And then they pass across the horizontal cells, which are supporting cells again, right? And then in, they're fed into your photoreceptors, which are found on the retina, called the rods and the cones. And they're called rods and cones, but they look at the shape. Cones are like conical in shape. Rods are rod-like in shape. Rods are your dark vision photoreceptors. Cones are your bright light and color receptors. That's what we are looking at here. So here you're using an instrument called an ophthalmoscope, which you must have come across if you have gone to the doctor's eye doctor's office, which they use to look into your eye. Uh, this is actually your retina in the back. Uh, this is your blind spot, your optic disc. This is where the optic nerve emerges. No rods and cones there, you're practically blind. Right next to it is the fovea centralis, which is the uh, most cone rich area. Most cones are concentrated here. Your best visual equity is found here in this region. Okay. Uh, and then you see a number of blood vessels. So while we are looking at this picture, remember in people with chronic hypertension, high blood pressure, or diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes, what you can see in this picture is something called cotton wool exudates in the back of the eyeball. So these are like literally like puffy cotton-like deposits that you will see here, uh, which is an indication of high blood pressure, blood and plasma leaking out because of high blood pressure, or even in advanced diabetes, you will see cotton wool exudates. That's not a good sign to see. A detached retina, right? Uh, in which the two layers of the retina detach uh, because of like a blow to the head, some injury. Also, if you're nearsighted, it's a, there's a higher chance of having that if you like, uh, you know, shake your head too vigorously, uh, any of those things. Uh, diabetics have a high risk of developing this too. Signs and symptoms, you see floaters in front of your eye and also curtain in the affected area, uh, an area of blindness that you cannot have, you do not have any vision there, right? And uh, if caught early enough, you can treat it by using something called a pneumatic retinopexy, which literally means uh, you inflate a balloon in the back of the eyeball, which pushes the two layers of the retina together. Macular degeneration is a, a genetic disorder for which there's no treatment, unfortunately. Uh, what happens here is your macula lutea, your, uh, the fovea centralis area, it starts to deteriorate. Your recept photoreceptors just start to die off, okay? Uh, higher chance in people with diabetes who have a family history of this, high blood pressure and eye trauma again, okay? So here you're looking at the lens of the eye, right? Uh, and the two positions that I was talking about earlier. What we are looking at in this picture, here is how the lens uh, accommodates. This is called accommodation when the lens uh, tries to accommodate whether you're looking far away or close up, all right? So again, remember how I talked about the uh, football shape of the lens versus the basketball shape? This is what you're looking at. So when you look at something which is far away, like the scenery, mountains, whatever, um, since it's far vision, your ciliary muscles actually relax. 
your iris relaxes. And so the suspensory ligaments uh, kind of tighten and pull the lens into this elongated football shape. And that causes a perfect uh, image to form upside down though. As you can see in the rays, it forms upside down on your fovea centralis, but our brain interprets it as up, upright image, okay? But interestingly, it forms upside down. But what happens when you look at a close object like your watch or your cell phone or reading a book or anything? Well, then your ciliary muscles contract and then your suspensory ligaments kind of also contract and they uh, make your lens more spherical like a basketball. And now this puts the vision, uh, the visual image in the right place here. Uh, but if you do this for too long, uh, these uh, permanently contracted or long time contracted ciliary muscles would cause a headache. So you have to basically look away to relax the muscles here uh, in your lens. As we get older, our, uh, we become farsighted. We become like this because our ciliary muscles, like the muscles of the body, they break down, they're not as strong. Our ciliary muscles are not that strong either. So we lose our ability to accommodate and to turn our lens like round uh, like a foot uh, like, like a basketball right so therefore uh far vision far sighted is what we become cataract again is basically mostly a genetic disease it tends to run in families are also common in people with high blood pressure or eye trauma rubbing your eyes scratching them too vigorously any of or all of them can lead to lead to cataract what happens here is the lens of your eye solidifies so from this transparent appearance it becomes uh hazy and opaque and milky. And so obviously that interferes with normal uh, vision. Uh, now you have techniques like fake emulsification where you literally, you can dissolve the protein of your uh, lens so it becomes clear again, okay? Uh, or you can use ultrasonic sound waves to shatter the solid protein of your, of your lens to make it clear and clean, okay? We talked about those two, vitreous humor and vit uh, acureous humor. Vitreous humor is found in the posterior chamber to give shape to the eyeball. The acureous humor is found in the anterior chamber. And uh, that is for the uh, nutrition and washing of your toxins and wastes uh, from, your, from your eyes. So this is how the acureous humor basically works. It is secreted by your ciliary uh, body, all right? Your ciliary processes, as you see here. And so it spills out, it washes the entire uh, anterior chamber, pours out of your pupil into the anterior chamber here in front of the lens, right? And then finally, it drains through your scleral, scleral venous sinuses. They drain the aqueous humor. Sometimes because of infections or trauma or rubbing or for no reason whatsoever, this drain, if you will, called the scleral venous sinus, this becomes clogged. So when this becomes clogged, the aqueous humor cannot drain. So it starts building up in your eye, your intraocular pressure or eye pressure rises and you develop glaucoma. So glaucoma is increased uh, eye pressure, intraocular pressure, because that fluid is not draining out through the, uh, through the drain, which is your scleral venous sinus, okay? Two types, uh, open angle and angle closure glaucoma. Angle closure glaucoma is more serious. It happens suddenly, like if when you walk, uh, from a dark theater out into bright sunlight or something like that, right? Or from bright sunlight into a dark room and there's a rapid uh, pupillary dilation that can precipitate ankle glau uh, closure glaucoma, serious condition, intense eye pain might be felt uh, in the eyeball at that point. You have to get to the ophthalmologists and the eye surgeon as soon as possible, or you might lose your vision for good. Open angle glaucoma is not as serious. It's a more chronic, uh, long, slow building disease, it takes time. And, uh, and sometimes no treatment is needed. It's just something that you keep on your watch. A congenital glaucoma is something that you are born with uh, and you have some problems with the uh, eye angle at any given time. All right. So why did my fire alarm go off? I'm not sure, I hope everything's all right. Okay, I'm gonna take notes anyway. My... Hold on. All right. Nothing escapes my attention here, right? Okay, so we have these terms here, emetropia, hyperopia, and myopia, three terms, right? So here are some terms that we are looking at that have to do with your visual function. So hopefully if it's 
working perfectly fine. Uh, that's called amyotropia, as you see here, parallel light rays focused on the retina. Hyperopia means uh, far vision uh, or farsightedness, all right? So hyper means greater than normal. So hyperopia is far, far away vision. And this is what happens with um, aging in, uh, in a lot of people naturally, right? And so you have trouble seeing up close, eyeballs too short. In other words, you have trouble turning your football shaped lens into a basketball shape, okay? And it's corrected with the, with the convex lenses, okay? Convex lenses, uh, because they bend the light rays inwards so that they focus on your retina better. Myopia is short-sightedness, and that is basically what I have too. And we're, okay, there. So uh, I am myopic, which means that uh, my lens is more permanently uh, basketball shaped as compared to uh, football shaped, okay? So it's too contracted at any given time. Uh, this condition is treated with what are called con concave lenses. Concave lenses are diverging lenses. They divert uh, diverge the light rays so that they fall on the retina uh, as they should. Um, and so concave lenses are used for correcting myopia. Astigmatism, when you have both myopia and um, hyperopia in the same eye uh, at different curvatures, right? Different parts of the eyeball has different curvatures there. So you might need special glasses or maybe even hard lenses in this case to correct as, uh, astigmatism. Press biopia, again, uh, aging. And that results in being farsightedness. Uh, reading close-up words becomes difficult. You might see people like with age, they hold their newspapers or devices, tablets farther away, right? Uh, because of this. And uh, what you would need is, again, uh, convex lenses here. Refraction of light is uh, the fact that the light rays bend when they move from one medium to another, such as when the light rays uh, move from air into water, they bend. And because of this bending of the light rays, um, the spoon seems to have been broken. It's not broken. It's simply that the light rays are uh, playing this trick because the light rays are bending. That's what you see. Okay. All right. So rods and cones, we talked about those two uh, types of photoreceptors, right? Here they are. Here's uh, the rods uh, and here's the cone. You can see the difference in the shape uh, of the two. Uh, rods, again, are your dark vision uh, receptors, and the cone is your uh, bright light and color receptor, okay? And uh, these are the different wavelengths of uh, the colors of the rainbow, right? This is the visual, the visible spectrum that we can see. And at what wavelength, uh, what type of colors do we see, as you can see? Okay, color blindness is a uh, sex-linked disorder. It's a genetic disorder. When I say sex-linked, that means uh, this trait is carried on the mother's X chromosome, uh, primarily inherited by their sons. So that's why males are much more likely to uh, suffer from color blindness. So hopefully during ANP2, when we get down to genetics, that's when I'm going to explain how this color blindness transmission actually takes place in genetic terms, okay? All right, so here we are looking at something called bleaching reaction and re regeneration of rhodopsin. So in other words, how do your eyes, uh, rather your photoreceptors, rods and cones adapt to light vision and dark vision, okay? So first up, when you are in light, and as you can see, the sun is uh, denoting that here, uh, rhodopsin, which is a kind of protein, it absorbs light in your, find in your uh, eyes, of course, in your photoreceptors, it absorbs light rays. Uh, and then something called cis retinal, which was found within the uh, opsin part is transformed to transretinal. So this is a chemical change that happens, all right? Uh, the transretinal uh, dissociates from opsin. Opsin is a protein. Uh, as opsin becomes activated, and this is called the bleaching reaction, okay? So now your cones are able to pick up colors and light in, in bright light, all right? So the transretinal detaches or dissociates from the opsin, okay? And this is called bleaching reaction. But what happens when the sun goes down and you're in dark conditions, uh, then the transretinal is reconverted back to cisretinal, right? What it started out with, uh, and this requires ATP. And once this happens, now, uh, the bleaching reaction is gone and your rods are able to see better in darkness. So bleaching reaction in light and then the uh, recycling of the same reaction during the dark phases. And here are the 
the steps and what happens in each step, all right? Dark adaptation, it is uh, a longer process. It takes anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes for your light, for your eyes to adapt to darkness, all right? <clears throat> because your bleached rods must regenerate the protein rhodopsin, this pigment, this visual pigment needs to be regenerated. It takes anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes, all right? Uh, light adaptation is much faster. If you walk out from a dark room into a lighted condition, then only five to 10 minutes for full adjustment, okay? Uh, so bleaching is fast. It doesn't take that long. It's the dark adaptation. That is a longer process as you can see, okay? And so here in these steps, you can look at uh, how this light and dark adaptation happens. Let's start with the light. What happens uh, in the light reaction here? Uh, here are the light rays that stimulate your uh, sodium and calcium ion channels to open up in your rods, right? And so when that happens, um, uh, that re results in a blockage or inhibition of your glutamate a neurotransmitter, okay? So, which means when the glutamate is not being transmitted, the bipolar cell is no longer inhibited, and then it depolarizes, and the bipolar cell then releases, uh, the new, uh, starts to release, the bipolar cell starts to release uh, the neurotransmitter called glutamate, and the glutamate neur neurotransmitter binds to uh, replace uh, in the ganglion cell, and this causes basically your light vision to take over, all right? What happens in the dark is uh, the dark current, again, causes instead of depolarization of the bipolar cells, it causes a repolarization of the bipolar cells. And when they're repolarized, there's no release of glutamate neurotransmitter from the bipolar cells, no nerve signal is generated uh, by the ganglion cell. So that is a dark vision over here, okay? So here is the uh, path that your vision takes uh, from your eyes through the optic nerves to an area called the optic chiasm, okay, right here. Then the crossover. So the right eye is generating an image in the left occipital cortex and the left eye is generating an image in the right occipital cortex, as you can see here, right? And so, uh, and on their way, they also are, uh, passing through these regions, the superior colliculus of the midbrain, as an example. The superior colliculus of the midbrain is the area responsible for visual tracking. So when you are tracking an object in front of your eye, uh, you're moving it side to side or up and down, that is basically possible because your um, superior colliculus is working uh, properly as it should, okay? So where is the conjunctiva located? In front of the eye. It's this transparent membrane that covers the front of the eye. Its functions, protection, and uh, support. How is lacrimal fluid spread across the eye surface? By blinking and removed from the orbital region by means of the scleral venous sinus. We looked at that. Uh, by, by means of the lacrimal uh, punctum or the lacrimal caruncle and then into the nasolacrimal duct and to the back of the throat. Uh, what are the three eye tunics? The fibrous tunic, uh, the vascular tunic, and then the the um, the retina, which is your uh, neural, uh, the nervous tunic. Uh, primary function of each tunic, the fibrous tunic like sclera and choroid are for support. The vascular tunic like the ciliary body, the ciliary process are for blood supply. And the, uh, the nervous uh, tunic is for photoreceptors like rods and cones in the retina. Compare the anatomic structure of the cornea and the lens. Cornea is this clear, transparent, fibrous, uh, membrane uh, in front of the eye, again, for diverging uh, and accommodating the light and for protection. The lens is this clear protein that, again, um, focuses the light on your retina. What are the functions of the vitreous humor? It maintains shape of the eyeball found in the posterior chamber. And the aqueous humor, it again gives nutrition and uh, washes away waste from the anterior chamber of the eye. Uh, describe how light is focused on the retina when viewing an object that is closer than 20 feet. Your ciliary muscles contract and your lens becomes more uh, football shaped, round, uh, basketball shaped rather, rounded, and that causes accommodation. Differences between rods and cones with respect to the anatomy. Rods look like rods, cones look like cones. They're photopigments. Uh, they have rhodopsin, right, uh, which is a visual pigment uh, that undergoes bleaching reaction in light and then dark adaptation.
How does dark adaptation differ from light adaptation? Dark adaptation takes longer, about 20 to 30 minutes. What occurs during phototransduction of light? Depolarization and repolarization of bipolar cells. What areas of the brain consciously perceive visual stimuli? Your occipital lobes. And which areas respond reflexively below the conscious level? Your uh, superior colliculus in your midbrain for visual tracking. Uh, what is the significance of some ganglionic axons crossing to the opposite side of the eye? Uh, well, the left eye is perceived and forms an image in the, uh, in the, in the right uh, occipital cortex and vice versa. All right, next up, we are focusing on our hearing sensation, right? The ear, as you can see, so which is divided into three parts. Here is your external ear, as you can see. Uh, this is called the auricle or the pinna the pin or the auricle, which is made up of a cartilage. This is your external acoustic uh, meatus or the external auditory canal. Uh, we have a bunch of wax secreting ceruminous uh, cerumen glands here, right? This is your eardrum or the tympanic membrane to the back of which is attached these the smallest bones in the human body, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. These are the smallest bones called the auditory ossicles found in the human body, which basically beat against this oval window, as you can see here. And the oval window behind it is this, this almost like a snail shaped structure called the cochlea, on top of which uh, the head of the snail or the feelers or antennae, whatever would be the semicircular canals. And this area here is basically the, uh, 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 the cochlea itself, as you see, right? And so from the uh, semicircular canals comes the vestibular nerve. And from the cochlea comes the co cochlear nerve, uh, the two join together to form the vestibular cochlear nerve or cochlear nerve number eight, uh, which goes to your temporal cortex, enabling you to listen, okay? All right, uh, at the same time in your, so this is your external ear, all the way from your auricle to your tympanic membrane or the eardrum, external ear. This is your middle ear from the back, uh, the behind of the uh, eardrum to the cochlea, this middle ear, and then everything uh, from this point onwards behind here, deeper here, uh, this is your inner ear. The middle ear also communicates with your throat or the pharynx by means of this tube called the uh, nasopharyngeal tube or the uh, eustachian tube, uh, eustachian tube here, okay? So let's talk about some uh, facts and figures as to uh, how you hear. So first up, uh, sound waves are vibrations, right? And you need a medium for those vibrations to travel through either air or water or solid or whatever. Uh, so once these vibrations are in the air, this uh, funnel shaped, uh, and even your ear, it kind of is shaped like a funnel, right? It funnels all these sound waves in here. Now, as the sound waves are moving in here, uh, sometimes there's too much wax, right? Uh, and wax impaction is the most common cause of partial or complete deafness. People complain of deafness, it's actually too much wax, impacted wax here, all right? So major cause of deafness is nothing but wax imp impaction, major cause of partial or complete deafness, all right? And this is a type of uh, what is called uh, conductive deafness or conductive deafness, okay? There's two types. There's conductive deafness versus uh, nerve deafness. Conduct, conductive, conductive deafness has to do with some blockage. Uh, the sound is unable to pass for whatever reason. Nerve damage uh, or nerve deafness is because of actual damage to the nerve, the vestibular cochlear nerve itself, all right? So for example, if you're wax, cleaning out the wax with hydrogen peroxide drops and gently washing them out, uh, that will resolve the issue, right? Um, but if you have actual nerve damage, then you need cochlear implants or a hearing aid or something like that, right? Okay, so uh, the sound wave anyways, uh, they travel here, they hit the eardrum, which starts to vibrate like a drum, right, eardrum. When it vibrates, these bones, uh, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, they start to vibrate with them as well. When they vibrate, they hit against the vestibule and the cochlea. So there are tiny hair cells within the cochlea that sense these vibrations and convert them into electrical signals, which are carried by means of the vestibular cochlear nerve to your brain for interpretation, simple as that. Uh, so what does the semicircular canals do here? See how they're oriented at 90 degrees to each other? So when you move your uh, head in circular motions, um, there's a fluid inside of uh, the semicircular canal, canals, which splashes around 
and the sploshing around of the fluid uh, gives you a sense of vertigo and dizziness. Uh, so that's what happens when you like spin uh, in place and then you just suddenly stop and you feel dizzy is because that fluid is still sploshing here and stimulating your nerves, giving you the sense of vertigo and dizziness, okay? All right, so the vest vestibular region here is for balance and the cochlear region is for hearing, okay? That's what you have to remember. So what is the importance of this structure here, the nasopharyngeal or the eustachian tube? The uh, importance is, uh, is, let's say you have like a, and it's more common in children, right? We all know kids have ear infections all the time. Why? Middle ear infections called otitis media. Otitis for ear infection, media means middle ear infection. So why otitis media common in children? Well, it's common in children because children often tend to have more colds and congestion in the throat than adults. And children also tend to have a smaller and more straight uh, eustachian tube. So all of this uh, gunk and all this mucus in their throats and their nose, they're blowing their nose all the time, they're wiping them. It can cause the mucus to backtrack through the eustachian tube into their middle ear, causing an infection. This is infected gunk from the throat ending up in, in the middle ear. Uh, what are the signs and symptoms? The child would be fussy, crying, pulling at their ears, either ear looks red and angry. When you look inside the ear with an otoscope, you see that the tympanic membrane or the eardrum is red and swollen uh, in worse case, and you can sometimes even see pus oozing out. Sometimes it's so bad that the eardrum ruptures. There's a hole and then you see the uh, uh, the pus oozing out from there, bad sign, right? Uh, the eardrum can also rupture if you're listening to a, like a rock concert or live near the airport and too much, you know, uh, loud sounds can also actually cause rupture, but it's, it, it's usually ear infections, infections of the ear that cause that, right? Uh, so obviously the treatment is uh, antibiotics to control the middle ear infection and also putting up an ear tube here in the eustachian tube. So this, what this ear tube does it, it keeps the a eustachian tube open and patent uh, so the mucus can flow back into the throat from the ear. But then you have to remove these ear tubes at a later time. Uh, so it's like a minor infection, a minor a surgical procedure that you have to implant those ear tubes here, okay? Right, so that is pretty much what we are looking at for the next few slides. All right, so this is one of the tiniest muscles in the human body, again, in the middle ear called the stapedius muscle. The job of the stapedius muscle is to stop these auditory ossicles from vibrating too violently if there's a loud sudden noise, because that would rupture your eardrum. And you must have felt it if there's like a loud sound out of a sudden, you feel this little muscle contract all of a sudden in your ear. It becomes more visible, uh, more uh, obvious as you age, actually. That's your stapedius muscle, which is trying to hold your uh, ossicles in place, okay? All right, so this is the insides of your cochlea. Uh, again, semicircular canals filled up with the fluid, which splashes around when you turn your head and it orients your senses to where you are. Here's the co cochlea inside of which is filled up with another fluid called the endolymph and also the perilymph. And the endolymph and the perilymph, again, um, pick up the sound signals, okay? And these in the spiral organ inside of here. And these sound signals are transmitted into electrical impulses, something called transduction, uh, and transmitted by the cochlear branch of the cranial nerve number eight to your uh, temporal cortex. Otitis media, we talked about middle ear infections, why they're common in children, how they're treated, what are the signs and symptoms, okay? All right, so this is the inside of your cochlea. So what are the structures you're seeing here? Uh, two membranes, vestibular membrane and basilar membrane. Basilar membrane picks up sounds, vestibular membrane picks up your body's position, all right? Uh, then scala vestibuli, again, for uh, sensing your position of the head, all right? And then the scala tympani for picking up sound signals, okay? And then finally, the, uh, here's your cochlear nerve that carries sound and uh, balance uh, sensations to your brain. So, so yet another close-up of the cochlea with the vestibular membrane and the basilar membrane over here, scala vestibuli for maintaining uh, your balance and scala tympani for making you hear sounds. So inside of the spiral organ within your co cochlea, this has been magnified so you can see it clearly, you see these little hair-like structures called the stereocilia, literally hair, right? Stereocilia. Whenever the sound travels here, they vibrate. When these hair vibrate, they cause uh, sodium ion channels to open up and depolarization in your uh, outer hair cells, these cells, and they carry the sound 
uh, sensations to your uh, cranial nerve number eight, which is your cochlear branch of the cranial nerve, of the vestibular cochlear nerve, all right? So here, this is your the entire journey, pathway of sounds uh, into your ear and how you perceive those sounds. Here are the sound waves in your external ear. See, they're hitting the, uh, the, the eardrum or the um, tympanic membrane. It starts to vibrate. That, that causes your three auditory ossicles, the bones to vibrate. Uh, they hit your cochlea through the uh, oval window here. And the sound frequency waves are transmitted all the way through your cochlea to your spiral organ. And that is causing your uh, inner hair cell to move. They're moving uh, because of the sound waves that are hitting them. So when they move, they, these hairs start, start, microscopic hairs start to move because of the vibrate because of the sound. They open up your sodium and potassium channels, causing depolarization. And that is that creates the action potential or the nerve impulse that is carried as sound to your brain. Okay. When you're listening to sound, uh, there's a number of things, uh, characteristics of sound like pitch. And pitch is basically the frequency of the vibrating object. Uh, it's measured in hertz, as you see here. Humans can hear in between 20 to 20,000 hertz. If you're a dog, then you can hear a dog whistle, right? Uh, or if you're a bat, you can pick up ultrasonic signals too. So your uh, hearing is much more sensitive as compared to, uh, to humans, as you see. So there you go. Those are the sound waves. The, the high frequency sound waves are in red. The medium frequency sound waves are in green and the low frequency ones are in blue. So the high frequency ones, they start vibrate, they vibrate the initial part of the basilar membrane, right? The medium uh, frequencies go till here halfway and then the low frequencies go all the way across the basilar membrane, okay? So as you age, you start losing your ability to hear your low frequency waves earlier than the medium and the high frequencies. Loudness uh, is how loud the sound is, okay? And uh, so how much volume of sound you're producing, and that is measured in decibels, as you can see, okay? So this is the pathway of sound and sensation of uh, position or your vestibular sensation from the cochlea and the semicircular canals. They go through the vestibular cochlear nerve. They get to your brainstem in the medulla oblongata here, right? And then they, so part of it go, goes to the superior olivary nucleus. And then from there to the inferior colliculus. The inferior colliculus is for your auditory tracking. So if someone calls your name from the right hand side, you look there. If someone calls your name from behind, you look back. So if you're looking in the wrong direction and somebody's calling you from the back, you're looking in the front, uh, something's wrong with your um, listening apparatus, maybe wax impaction. If you have wax impacting one of your ears, it'll mess up your inferior colliculus as well. So then from there, uh, the signals and sensations go up to your primary auditory cortex in your temporal lobe, as you can see here. Uh, and they do synapse in the thalamus, the post office of the brain, as you can see. Here you can look at all of the steps, the journey that the sound waves take through the brain stem, then onto the inferior colliculus, then onto your uh, thalamus, and then finally, finally to your primary auditory cortex for interpretation. Two types of deafness, we talked about it, conductive deafness versus sensory neural deafness, okay? Conductive deafness is things like if you have uh, too much wax in your ears, that's one type of conductive deafness. Another thing that can happen in conductive deafness is with age in some people, these auditory ossicles, the three little bones, they become hard and fixed and rigid. They don't vibrate. When the eardrum vibrates, they don't vibrate. And this is a disease called autosclerosis, which literally means hardening of the ears. Auto is ear, sclerosis is uh, hardening. So with autosclerosis, these bones become hard and fixed. They don't vibrate. No sound is conducted inwards, conductive deafness. Or if you rupture your eardrum, of course, because of loud sounds or a middle ear infection, that's a type of conductive deafness too, because it's not carrying the sounds in. Or wax impaction, we talked about that. Nerve deafness means you've actually damaged your cochlear nerve. So for that, you will need a hearing aid or a cochlear implant, which acts as a transducer. What a cochlear plan, implant does is it takes over the job of the cochlea. It simply uh, takes up the sound vibrations and converts them into electrical signals and then transfers them to your uh, temporal lobe for further uh, interpretation, okay? All right, equilibrium is your sense of position. Right, and that is monitored by your vestibular apparatus. It's made up of the semicircular canals, the utricle and the saccule, okay? 
the utricle and the saccule, those two organs detect linear acceleration, such as when you're traveling at high speed in a car, linear, straight. The semicircular canals detect angular circulation when you're moving your head in circles, okay? So let's take a look here. This, uh, the utricle and the saccule, these two organs, they detect your movement in a linear way when you're going straight, such as traveling in a car in a straight line. The semicircular canals, which are these, they detect angular, like circular motion on the head, okay? So when you move your head side to side, uh, you see how the hair are sl sloshing around. The fluid here is uh, making you those little kind of cilia move. And so when these hair move, they generate uh, electrical signals. And your brain basically picks up those signals as your head, head moving in different directions, right? So for example, when the lady looks upwards, which is hyperextension of the neck, uh, the little hair cells in her, in her uh, utricle and saccule move backwards. When she bends her neck forwards, then the hair move in the opposite direction, okay? So uh, so they are picked, th these signals are picked up uh, by your brain in, in different ways. And it tells the brain whether you're looking, moving your head up or down or what direction it's basically going in, all right? So angular acceleration, when you move your head in circular motion, that's when the fluid sloshes around in all directions in your semicircular canals, and that disturbs these little kinocilia, these hair-like projections in all different directions, right? As the head rotating side to side, look at what happens to those hair. They're also sloshing around with the fluid, and these bending stereocilia, these little hair, they will generate nerve impulses to your brain, telling it that you're now rotating your head. That's what it does. All right, so this is your sense of position. It... Uh, all of the uh, sensory input, information about the position of your body goes through the vestibular branch of the cranial nerve number eight. Uh, it goes on to your brainstem here, right? Uh, it also makes connections with your cerebellum because remember you need your cerebellum for you, maintaining your muscle memory and your balance. So cerebellum also gets some input from there. And then it rises up through, through the, uh, the cranial nerves here onto the thalamus, the post office of the brain, and then the thalamus finally sends this sense of position to your cerebral cortex uh, to make you understand what position you are in at any given time. What is the function of the external acoustic meatus? That's your external auditory canal. The function is to transfer, transmit sound from outside and direct it to the inside of the ear. Where are the auditory ossicles, the little bones located? in your middle ear, their function, they vibrate with your uh, tympanic membrane or with your eardrum uh, in order to, to make you hear, basically. What are the membranous labyrinth structures? They're found within your uh, cochlea and uh, the specific bony labyrinth structure in which each resides are the scalar tympani and the scalar vestibuli. Uh, they help you hear and they help you maintain your balance. Uh, what are the steps for detecting sounds? The sound goes through the external auditory canal hits your eardrum, makes it vibrate, which makes the little bones vibrate, which uh, make uh, the last bone, which is stapes, tap on th through the oval window on your cochlea. And this tapping makes the little hair cells in the cochlea vibrate. And this vibration is transduced into electrical signals and then carried to your brain. Uh, compare the difference in how we perceive pitch versus how we perceive loud loudness. Pitch is frequency, how many sound, uh, waves per second. Loudness is how big those sound waves are. Pitch is measured in hertz. Loudness is measured in decibels. All right, so then what are the major brain structures involved in the auditory pathway? It's your vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve, then your brain stem, then your thalamus, uh, also the uh, the inferior colliculus for auditory tracking, and then go, it goes up to your cerebral cortex. What type of movement do the maculae detect? Uh, linear acceleration, all right? Linear, straight acceleration. How do they detect this movement? Because of the movement of the little uh, hair in, in the inner ear. What types of movement do the ampullae detect? Angular motion, okay? Angular motion, circular motion. And how do they detect this movement? Again, because of the little hair uh, the fluid sloshing about, moving the little hair in different directions, which is picked up as a change in your position, the, head, the position of your head by your uh, cerebral cortex or your brain. Okay, there you go. So we are officially done with our semester one lectures, uh, chapter 16. Uh,
Uh, again, final reminder, make sure you are done with all of your lecture quizzes. We still have time before we reach the deadline. You're able to turn in all of your lab work uh, and you have the study guide for your uh, upcoming exams and everything. Uh, so very best of luck. It was a pleasure uh, being your instructor this uh, semester. Hopefully you learned a thing or two and good luck on your forthcoming exams. Some of you I will see uh, during ANP2 as well. Uh, take care. Take care, good care of your health, your surroundings, your ecosystems, and do the same for others. And I wish for the very best for your uh, careers, for your personal lives. And uh, let me know if you have any questions or feedback. All right, have a great rest of the session, a great semester. Bye-bye.